In the 1960s, an article portrait of an unknown man was published in one of the Petropavl newspapers. Here is the portrait. And here is this man. This is the last photograph of the outstanding Kazakh poet and prose writer Makhshan Shomabayev. And here is his story. Following Makhshan's arrest in 1938, the NKVD searched the home of his elder brother, Abba Muslim. Abba Muslim hid his brother's portrait under a portrait of Lenin on the wall. The NKVD officers did not discover anything after searching the entire house. They did not even consider examining behind the Lenin's portrait because it was unacceptable to remove and touch the portrait of the Soviet leader. After the search, Abba Muslim was also arrested. Leaving, he whispered to his wife, in a week, wipe the dust off the Lenin's portrait. Of course, Abba Muslim's wife Gulbaram found this photo, but until the end of her days, she did not tell anyone about it, and before her death, she told her son Kabdosh, never take a portrait of Lenin off the wall. And so he did. The photo remained hidden for many, many more years, and only in the 1960s, the children of Kabdosh wanting to change the portrait of the leader to the portrait of their parents, found this photo. However, they did not recognize the man in the photograph and took it to the editor. The story is yet another example of how the memory of prominent but objectionable figures from that era was destroyed. What to say about others if the closest family members knew nothing about Makhjan? Despite the fact that Jumabayev was legally rehabilitated in 1960, his work was prohibited until the mid-1980s. Why? What was the Soviet regime so frightened about? Everything is simple. Makhjan's poetry had strength, and his work reflected, as if in the mirror, all of the country's and people's hardships. The step gave me the calling of the eagle. Altai and Ural are two mighty wings of mine. I am a favorite of the steppe freedom. I grew up as a Batyr, knowing no fear and evil. My ancestor was a giant, if you want to know. My mother was the wisest of the wise. I am a young tiger. I am a flying flame. Hey, dogs. Who can keep me? I will revive the spirit of my great-grandfather for centuries. You will be free, Sari Arka. Your descendants, giant, will grow happy, stretching their power above the steppe. He is a genius, a brilliant poet. If anyone is interested in feeling what a genius is, well, take Pushkin's poetry and read it, and then read Marjan, a happy property of Marjan's poetry. A happy property of poetry for us is that it is possible to translate. It is clear, transparent, it is inspired, it is incredibly inspirational. Marjan. Marjan Jumabayev always said that if people have honor and conscience, then these people are eternal. Muhtar Awezov often repeated these words of Makhjan Jumabayev. He was always like that. Born in the picturesque areas of northern Kazakhstan in the Petropavl district, he could wander for hours as a child, admiring either the clouds drifting in the blue sky or the stars, enormous and bright, as if illuminating all around throughout the day, thrilling the imagination. Makhjan's parents were wealthy people. His father Bikin was a bee, a volost governor. Thus, he was able to provide a good education for all of his children. Makhjan had six brothers and two sisters. But the entire family had high hopes for Makhjan, 
who had shown a bright intellect and excellent intelligence to everyone around him since childhood. At the age of four, the boy was assigned a teacher who taught him languages and literature. At the age of 14, he wrote his first poetry. He recognized right away that poetry is his calling. Abai's work had a huge impact on Makhjan. He refers to him as a poet and scientist without parallel, a thinker who trod on slavery, in his lyrics. Makhjan's talent as well as Abai's talent included in itself the collaboration of Eastern and European poetry. But unlike his predecessor and idol Abai, Makhjan did not edify in his poems, but simply enjoyed the beauty of the syllable, the rhyme. Also, Makhjan Jumabayev introduced new types of versification into Kazakh poetry for the first time, such as white verse, free verse, and a poem in prose. As a teenager, he entered the Petropavl Madrasa, then went to Kazilorda. In the 1910, Shumabayev became a student of a higher Muslim institution in Ufa. The Tatar classical writer Golumjan Ibrahimov became Magjan's mentor and teacher. He helped Magjan publish his first poetry collection called Shulpan in 1912. This edition, printed in Kazakh using an Arabic script, brought the first fame to the young poet. The moth hurries to the flame, making a crazy flight. He, the poor fellow, is unaware that the flame will burn his wings. Like moth, we will burn to the ground. We are in this abyss of fire, where instead of gold ash, the ash and shroud are waiting for us. He was a moth flying into the light indeed. He flew to the light of truth and love. He never felt sorry for himself. He never withheld his strength and feelings. If something truly fascinated him, he gave himself to it with all his heart and soul. In 1913, he entered the Omsk Teachers Seminary, where he graduated with a gold medal. Here in Omsk, he meets like-minded people and friends with whom he will go through life. The future leaders of the Alash party, Ahmed Baitursinov, Rajak Abdulatov, and Alihan Bukihanov, representatives of the advanced Kazakh intelligentsia, immediately drew attention to the talented poet. What Magjan wrote in his poems was meaningful and relatable to each of them. The thirst for freedom and a new life, for independence, burned with fire in their hearts and sounded in Magjan's poems. From now on, he became a regular participant in their meetings and initiatives. When the Alash Orda government of 25 individuals was created at the second national Kazakh Kurultai, 10 seats in the new administration were designated for representatives of other nations living among Kazakhs, while 15 were elected among ethnic Kazakhs. As a result, representatives of other nationalities received 40% of the seats. Furthermore, it was proposed that those peoples who do not have their own land be granted extraterritorial autonomy within the Republic of Alash. You see, it was an international state, not a multinational one, but a national one with national diasporas. These are exceptionally enlightened individuals who, as the Kazakhs say, took up this struggle. There was no alternative view. There were no other values in life but fighting with all your might for the salvation of this land and its people. They did it. They then began to look in different directions. And there was Magjan Jumabaev with his poems. The Russian Revolution of 1917 resulted in the fall of the monarchy, a chance for all people of the national periphery to start over, a chance for Kazakhs. Magjan was nominated as a candidate for the Constituent Assembly and a member of the panel tasked with preparing textbooks for Kazakh schools following the announcement of Alash's autonomy. Magjan approached this endeavor with all the energy and zeal inherent in his nature. He was little interested in politics, but education, especially education of his native people, was something Shumabayev was willing to devote himself to without hesitation. 
His efforts resulted in the publication of school textbooks as well as a study on pedagogy. Mohsan Jumabayev is, in fact, the founder of Kazakh pedagogy. It is the teacher, the educator who takes the lead in the upbringing of the younger generation. He is the one who identified the most significant qualities required for a teacher to fully and effectively interact with children. And the most crucial thing, according to Marjan, is respect for the child's personality, as well as beautiful, competent speech that can captivate, make the child's imagination work. The time will come when Marjan would return to teach at the Petropavl school, and his students would later remember him as follows. From the memoirs of Tatiana Nitiosova, a former student of the school named after Alexander Pushkin, I remember very well the moment when Marjan Bikenovich first entered our class. After just a few lessons, we became fond of the new teacher. Even the most fidgety boys caught his word with bated breath. And after the lesson was finished, it was almost impossible to kick us out of the class. In Petropavl, Marjan would meet Zuliha Zhaltyrova for the first time, the woman who played the most important role in his life. They immediately liked each other, but life made its adjustments. Marjan had to leave for a while, and Zuliha was asked to marry another rich, powerful person who could solve her family's financial issues, which had been left without a breadwinner. Marjan threw himself into work. He's actively involved in journalism and writes a lot, writes the poem Baterbayan and the novel Sholpan's Sin. Marjan was highly regarded. They compared him to Bryusov, believing Bryusov to be the highest degree of literary intelligence. People took into account Marjan's vast knowledge. Marjan was also physically attractive. It's seen in the images. He was charming in communication. If he arrived to Earth to change things by relying on people, he must be in every way beautiful. He had a distinct personality. It complemented his poetic sermons, the sermons and callings. In 1923, a new phase of life has begun. Marjan arrives in Moscow at the invitation of People's Commissar of Education Luna Charsky. He teaches Oriental languages at the Communist University of the Working People of the East, while also studying. At the Moscow Literary and Art Institute, which was led at the time by Brusev, and it was Brusev who dubbed Zhumabayev the Kazakh Pushkin. Brusev also was the one who discovered the concept of symbolism in Russian poetry, and Marjan's poems are imbued with deep symbolism. He is a child of turbulent times, a witness to social disasters, who has spent his entire life on the verge of life and death, good and evil, ice and fire. In Moscow, he translates into Kazakh the works of Russian and world classics such as Gorky, Lermontov, Bloch and Balmont, as well as poems by Goethe, Hein and other foreign poets into Kazakh language. It was a huge and vital work that he did to educate his people. We gained access to a wide range of great literature thanks to Marjan Shumabayev, who, like his teacher Abai, took up classic translations. Of course, Marjan was affected considerably by his connection with Russian poets such as Yesenin, Mayakovsky and Mandelstam. The best lyrics, love lyrics in the Kazakh oral art in all of its history, both observable and known to us, are the poems of Marjan Zhumabayev. These are amazing, divine lyrics. I myself know the confirmation of this thesis. I can refer to the examples close to me. My mother, Fatima Gabitova, a spouse of Ilyas Jansugurov, received numerous poems of his, dedicated to her. They were magnificent poems. Ilyas Jansugurov was also a prominent poet, an amazing poet. But Fatima, our mother, when she was already in exile, she used to say that no matter what, the best poet born on Kazakh land is Marjan.
ақын қазақтың топрағында туған мағжан деп. Kiss me, my darling, again and again. Healing warm poison flows in my blood. I will not give minutes of this pleasure, not for the king's throne or the whole earth's wealth. These lyrics are dedicated to Makhshan's first wife, Zineb, the niece of Shokan Walikhanov, a well-born, educated beauty, captivated the poet's heart, and they got married. They lived happily and amicably, but not for long. Zineb died in childbirth, leaving Makhshan with her newborn son. The baby lived for only nine months and died of pneumonia. For Makhshan, everything that happened was a terrible blow. But he couldn't imagine it was just the beginning of a series of trials in his life. The 1920s, the period of Kazakhstan's so-called first famine. The young Kyrgyz Soviet Republic, as Kazakhstan was then called, faced it as a result of the Soviet government's war communism policy. The Bolshevik requisition, the winning of livestock from the population and the civil war. Crop failure and livestock losses exacerbated the situation. People from the countryside rushed to the cities in search of work and food. Many fled Kazakhstan, heading for China, Uzbekistan and Russia. Mahjan Jumabayev was a member of the Extraordinary Commission for Assisting the Hungry at the time. This commission was responsible for collecting food and funds for the less fortunate and assisting street children. There were a lot of them in Kazakhstan after the civil war, and Jumabayev used all of his strength to alleviate his people's suffering in whatever way he could. The bearer of this, Deputy Chairman of the Akmola Provincial Emergency Commission for Assistance to the Hungry Zhumabayev Magjan Bikenovich, is sent to Petropavlovsk and Kokchetav districts to strengthen the work of helping the starving. Comrade Zhumabayev is instructed to make an accurate account of the products received by the relief fund for the hungry, check the latter accounts and, if defects and shortcomings are found, immediately eliminate them. Make an accurate count of the hungry and attach the starving areas to more prosperous ones. To take measures to increase the flow of voluntary donations of livestock and foodstuffs through agitation. Livestock and products received by voluntary donation to be distributed among the hungry based on generally applicable rules. The worst thing was that the Soviet administration in Moscow was unaware of the magnitude of the disaster. As a result, no effective steps to eliminate it were implemented. The Central Commission for Assistance to the Hungry, led by Sid Kalimindeshev at the time, regularly petitioned Moscow to acknowledge the hungry in the Orenburg, Ural, Oktobe, Bukhev and Kostanai regions. It was critical that the state food tax be repealed in these areas. One way or another, at least one million people died during the first wave of the famine in Kazakhstan. The first famine was unexpected because cattle were confiscated from Kazakhs for the first time. This was the basis for the Kazakh lifestyle. Cattle dominated the nomadic economy at the time. Kazakhstan made its transition from nomadism to agriculture in 1928. Before then it followed a nomadic lifestyle. Then, as you pointed out, the revolution and civil war between whites and reds affected the situation. The cattle were taken away by both sides and because of this, people were left without cattle for the first time they began to starve. It was of course the first blow to the Kazakh people. Mahjan Jumabayev truly demonstrated his position at that time. We must give credit to the fact that before the famine, the American corporation ARA worked in Orenburg assisting the hungry. Even at the time, America and Europe aided the hungry. It helped the people in the Volga region and what was left of that help was given to Kazakhstan but all of the assistance went to factories and industrial facilities. 
because the proletariat or working class came first and Kazakhs were called the peasantry and the peasantry was regarded as the rich element of society that had everything, despite the fact that it didn't. That was a dreadful time in history. Refugees, homeless people, overcrowded train stations. Every now and then, epidemics broke out. People had to eat grass, roots and carrion. Mashan's heart was broken by the people's suffering. He poured his pain out on paper in bitter lines. Do you hear, fate? I do not want alms. Measure my suffering in full, burn on fire, rot in three death. If I wake the people with verses, the grief will recede and the hot flame will dry up the tears. What do I need them for? When the harsh years of retaliation against dissidents arrive, it will be for these lyrics that he would be labeled as a decadent, pessimistic poet yearning for medieval days. Of course, Mojan was not a pessimist. Even in his darkest moments, it was as if a light, life-giving and warming, was burning in his soul. Even during the most terrible years, his heart was capable of love. Once Abdullah Akchurin, a wealthy merchant, and his young wife, Gulsum, moved from Kazan to Petropavl. Marjan lost his peace the moment he saw her. What he didn't do to attract the attention of an elusive beauty, he dedicated beautiful poems to her, but this love had no future. Gulsum's husband learned about this relationship and took his wife to Moscow, vowing to kill Marjan. Да. Marjan had a lot of enemies. He was young, handsome, talented and well-educated. He was born into an affluent family, adored by women, respected by friends and admired by the people. All of this led to rejection not only from ideological opponents, but also from his colleagues, who envied him. They couldn't forgive him for his undeniable brilliance. As a result, accusatory articles more akin to denunciations began to emerge in the press as early as the mid-1920s. Of course, his followers supported him. Smagol Sadvakasa, for example, publicly vowed that if we destroy Marjan, we will destroy everything. Koshke Kimengerov and Mukhtar Awezov encouraged detractors to stop and be more careful in relation to the poet. However, their words were drowned out by a massive chorus of a bloodthirsty crowd. It was all because people envied him. Sabit Mukhanov, for example, was terribly jealous of him. People said that neither Sakyan Sifulin nor Ilyas Jansugurov, nobody was a rival to Magjan Jumabaev. But Sabit Mukhanov considered himself his rival. He considered himself such a great poet, a proletarian poet. There are even Magjan Jumabaev's words. In one of his articles, he wrote how far we have left that if anyone can rhyme the lines, he was already considered a poet, as long as he was of proletarian origin. And he ridiculed Mukhanov. He has poems, humorous, satirical poems, where he ridiculed Sabit Mukhanov. Of course, Sabit Mukhanov did not forgive him for this, and throughout his life he took revenge, both during the life of Magjan and after his death. In Orenburg, a literary court was organized over Marjan in 1924. They investigated his poems collection. The following resolutions were passed after the meeting. Number one, Shumabayev must be recognized as an enemy of the Kazakh people and an enemy of the Soviet government, which is the defender of the Kazakh people. Number two, it is essential to request that the government remove all his publications from circulation. Number three, prohibit the publication of Zhumabayev's works in Soviet publishing houses in the future. This happened right at the start of 1924. Sabit Mukhanov, a Soviet Kazakh writer, was literally behind this literary trial of Magjan Zhumabayev. The most interesting thing is that in 1918, during the civil war, Sabit Mukhanov was hiding in the city of Omsk in the apartment of Magjan Jumabaev. 
Mahjan Jumabai first helped him find work so he could feed himself, then he found him an apartment. Furthermore, while living under the same roof, Mahjan Jumabai taught Mukhanov Russian language and Kazakh grammar. And then, six years later, Sabit Mukhanov organized a literary trial against Jumabaev. Sabit Mukhanov organized a literary trial against Jumabaev. Mahjan Jumabaev was a very well-known poet. Mahjan Jumabaev was recognized by everyone. All of the poets at the time regarded Mahjan Jumabaev as the most talented poet. For example, Sakyan Fulin regarded him as such. In their lines or articles, they don't say anything about Mahjan Jumabaev being a mediocre poet and writer. Sabit Mukhanov asked three questions at the poor council. The first question is to declare Mahjan Jumabaev an enemy of the Soviet regime. He is an enemy of the Soviet government. He participated in the Second Alashorda Congress, held in Orenburg in 1917. They accused him of being together with Alihan Bokeyhan and Ahmed Baytursunov. They accused him of writing poetry specifically for being the author of the famous youth march, I believe in youth. The second point of accusation was the demand that all of Mahjan Jumabaev's books and published poems be removed removed from everywhere, it was no longer allowed to publish them, and books to be taken out from the libraries. The second point was this, and Sabit Mukhanov's third point, the third point of accusation, was that he should not be allowed to participate in literary activities, or in general, public Soviet activities at the time. Yes, the literary world became a type of theater of military operations and ideological conflict during those years. Poets and writers were divided into two opposing camps, those dubbed singers of the revolution and bourgeois nationalists. Marjan Jumabayev was included in the latter. Everything he wrote was disputed and condemned. It was a time of cruel persecution, but Mahjan endured it with dignity because he knew his own worth and could not be shaken by the hateful words of envious people. During these years, he creates the literary circle al Kha, as well as the literary and artistic program tabal which was approved by Bukihanov, Kozhanov and Aymautov. Zuliha became his guardian angel, his great supporter. Yes, his very first love from whom he was estranged. They never parted once they met again. Everyone condemned them, but Zuliha and Marjan were indifferent to the gossip. They were happy together. They were brought together by their passion of poetry and art. They could talk about the most intimate things for hours, and Zuliha became not only Marjan's wife, but also the first person to hear his poems. She also knew all of the works by heart. Zuliha supported Marjan at his most difficult trials. Even when he himself was in despair, he destroyed his works because they were repeatedly criticized by untalented people with no sense or style. They shouted that his poems were dangerous and reactionary. The only thing they couldn't hold him guilty for was his poetry's lack of beauty and refinement. He was subjected to fraudulent, false criticism and the defamation, prosecution and conviction of Mahjan Jumabayula started with the Sabit Mukhanov's initiative. Then his criticism, persecution and defamation were supported by Kazakh Soviet writer classic Abdilda Tajabai, and then Gabbas Tohjanula, a prominent figure, literary critic who also sharply criticized Mahjan, Josubek Aymautula and Mahjan Jumabayula were the first victims of Soviet power in Kazakhstan.
Shumabayev was arrested in 1929. Years of persecution and defamation had an impact. Furthermore, Filip Golashokin raged in our area during those years, organizing a small October in Kazakhstan. More than 300 members of Kazakh intelligentsia were assassinated at the same time as a result of his alleged activity. Makhshan was condemned to 10 years in the camps after being taken to the notorious Butyrka jail. An excerpt from Makhshan Jumabayev's letter to his wife Zuleikha. Zuleikha, sweetheart. I have caused you so much pain in my life that I don't know if I'll ever be able to thank you. It hurts me to inform you that your husband has been imprisoned for 10 years. For a whole 10 years. Most importantly, I don't feel any guilt. On the other hand, you know I am not to blame for anything. I beg you, Zuleikha, come to me. But first, in Moscow, go to Lubyanka and get permission for a date. Then go to Maxim Gorky and explain that they took me without reason, that I was not to blame for anything, and that I demonstrated no, you hear, no rejection of the new government and October. On the contrary, She followed him everywhere. A selfless, dedicated woman spent many years wandering, but wherever he was, he always had the feeling that she was nearby. When he was working on the construction of the Belomor Canal, cutting trees in Karelia, was surviving in the Solovetsky Special Purpose Camp. Makhshan told her, Zuliha, dear, I would like to put you on my shoulders and carry you all the way to Mecca. When she returned to the camp with her legs battered to blood, for me, you've become a saint. As Makhshan had requested in his letters, it was Zuliha who went to Gorky and his wife Yekaterina Bishkova and begged them to help her husband. As a result, the term was cut by three years. Mahjan was released in 1936. The fate of the poet. Sorry for the sadness, Kazakh people. Only one thing is a pity. You may condemn a warm heart, but not this eternal tablet. The roads are desperate and difficult. They are saturated with the sun of creations. I lived and laughed, burned and rushed about. People, if you can, forgive the poet. He went back home to Petropavl, he looked for work for a long time. He found one at school, then at a technical school. But they barred him from going anywhere, bringing up previous sins. But the worst part was that he was denied the chance to create and convey his work to the reader. The poet, endowed with God's gift of creation, was forced to remain silent. Makhjan was arrested again on December 27, 1937. This time he was charged with having ties to Japanese intelligence, as well as counter-revolutionary actions, Pan-Turkism and bourgeois nationalism. From Makhjan Jumabayev's interrogation protocol, he was arrested as a member of an anti-Soviet Nazi organization that existed in Kazakhstan, and on its borders they carried out active anti-revolutionary work. Do you feel guilty about it? I do not consider myself guilty of this. However, he will confess on all accounts of the charges in a week. One can only imagine what type of torture and abuse these confessions were wrenched from the poet. 
to the KSSR People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs statement by prisoner Marjan Zhumabaev. To make amends with the Soviet authorities, I declare unequivocally that I confirm the accusations made against me that I, Drumabaev, have been involved in espionage activities in favor of one of the foreign states for several years. I, Drumabaev, began espionage for Japan in 1919 and continued this work until 1929, when I was captured and sent to the camps. I began my espionage activities in support of the specified state after leaving those and returning to Kazakhstan in 1936. He was already expecting death as a way to get away from suffering. And on a spring day, March 19 in 1938, the brightest Kazakh poet was executed as an enemy of the people. All members of Makhshan's family were subjected to repression after his death, his father, his brothers and sisters. I am exhausted. I've run out of strength. The day is dank and the wind is grey. Lamenting, crying out loud. I catch vague speeches. Somewhere out there, far, far away. Someone died and was buried in the ground. Hear the wind, calm the excitement. Death brings us comfort. I drink the sweetest flower with my heart. You come and lull me to sleep. Lull me to sleep. Death. After the poet was destroyed, the revolutionaries went after his work. His works were prohibited for 50 years. Once they were discovered, they were destroyed. The poet was unknown to several generations of Kazakh people. Akmola Provincial Department of Literature and Art. According to the available information, a collection of poems in the Kazakh language by Marjan Zhumabaev is in circulation in Kyrgyz Department of Literature and Art in the Akmola province. Take decisive measures to remove such a publication from circulation and hold the withdrawn copies until further notice. Head of the Literary Association, Kandratov. However, it is well known that manuscripts do not burn. Marjan's poems full of faith, love and hope have been preserved in the minds of many true poetry connoisseurs. Zuliha kept his works, despite the fact that they were mortally dangerous. I am happy to share with you what I know very well about Zuliha Apa the widow of Marjan Zhumabaev. She was something. I was a student in Moscow, and when I came home, my mother, Fatima and Zuleikha Pai would sit under the apple tree, put on the samovar and share their experiences. Both of them were persecuted. It was evident that Zuleikha Apa was a very beautiful woman, tall and slender in her youth. She was dark-skinned. And my mother, half-jokingly, when they finished drinking tea, would say to me, now take this dark-skinned old lady to her home. She was amazing. She seemed to be of Bashkir ancestry, in my opinion. But she was very dedicated. This is not even because she followed the Muslim religion, but the highest culture of absolute devotion to the memory of Marjan. Here, it is necessary to say a very important thing. After 32 years of our independence, we are still telling a half-truth, or we just kept silent until now. But these things that I heard back in the early 1990s, precisely at the dawn of our independence, from our colleagues, scientists and literary critics. Just imagine, based on these episode, who were the Kazakh Soviet classical writers? For example, Sabit Mukhanov, Abdilda Tajibayev and many others. So in 1938, the last three grand figures of Kazakh literature were shot Sakyan Sifulin, Ilyas Jansugurov and Bimbet Mailin. 
скажем, гранда казахской литературы, это Сакен Сифулин, Ильяс Жансугуров, Бимбит Малин. Группа... A group of future classics of Kazakh Soviet literature, led by Sabit Mukanov, climbed the mountain Koktobie and celebrated this day and the fact that now they would become classics of Kazakh Soviet literature. And they were right about it. Later, Sakyan Seyfulin, Ilyas Jansugurov and Bimbiat Mailin were rehabilitated, as far as I know, in 1960s and Magjan Jumabayev much later. Zuliha lived to be 96 years old. She devoted the rest of her life to saving and resurrecting her beloved's name and works from oblivion. Magjan was formally rehabilitated in 1960, but his creations were illegal for more than 20 years after that. The Writers' Union opposed the poet's creative rehabilitation. In this instance, I want to mention two names, Alexander Lazarevich Zhovtis and Mahmudov. His friends called him Kaha Mahmudov. This was a very solid, powerful professor, a great connoisseur, a maestro in the humanities, a philologist, an author of dictionaries and a very influential person. Zhovtis Alexander Lazarevich was a very educated person, he always had greatness of thought. At the department where they worked, Zhovtis made a line-by-line -line translation of Magjan Jumabayev's poems, while Mahmudov wrote about Magjan. They prepared material for the publication at Prostor magazine. And at this magazine, Magjan's poems prepared by Zhovtis and Mahmudov were already typed. At the last moment, of course, the world is not without mean people. Poems being prepared for publication were destroyed. The entire edition. Mahmudov was severely reprimanded. You can't do this anymore, he was told. He was a luminary. Alexander Lazarevich was fired. He was one of the best lecturers, a professional, a real scientist in linguistics and literature. This is an amazing thing. Then he wrote books, but he was fired. Kali Bilalov, the Minister of Education at the time, called them to the meeting. Professor Mahmudov, Zhovtis and B. Simbaikinjabaev and the whole group of scientists were there. Bilalov started reprimanding them. How could you allow for such a thing to happen and hold meetings within the walls of the university? The entire faculty of philology and two faculties of journalism gathered together to hold those meetings. Well, all of them were silent. And then Zhovtis said, Kali Bilalevich, you are a Kazakh intellectual and this is a great Kazakh poet. Maybe you will cut some slack. Bilalov was surprised what kind of slack should he make. He said there was no such poet in Kazakh literature as Magjan Jumabayev, that he was unknown. He never was, nor ever will he be. Imagine what he said. Alexander Lazarevich Zhovtis, doctor of philology, professor and well-known translator, wrote about this in his memoirs. He translated both Magjan and Abai a lot. He was one of the first translators of that time. And when it all started, the Central Committee issued a resolution in 1968 that this meeting was erroneous. They called Magjan Jumabayev a former Alashorda member, a bourgeois nationalist and all sorts of names. And they closed this topic even though the poet was rehabilitated in 1960. Poet, 
The poet and his work were first returned to the public in 1989 when his collection of poetry was released. And with his insightful poems we can rediscover and appreciate a bygone era. The era, the spirit of which was mirrored in Marjan's poems, the era in which he was born, formed and unfortunately died. His work had stood the test of time and today we read Marjan with pleasure. We, the new generation, will finally bring his name and poems back from oblivion. After all, his farewell remarks are directed to us through the veil of time. I believe in youth. Mighty like a lion, strong like a tiger, with strong wings like an eagle, I believe in youth. There is fire in their eyes, there is fire in their words, they are dearer to me than the soul. I believe in youth. The great slogan of Alash, the Holy Quran, they are the friends of Alash. I believe in youth. I believe in youth. One day they will raise the name of Alash to the sky. I believe in youth. <laughs>